Welcome, and thank you for joining today's educational webinar, The Art of Impactful Giving, Strategic Planning with Passion and Purpose, brought to you by Impact Austin Foundation. Hello, I join you today in my capacity and my honor to be serving as the president of the board of directors of Impact Austin, and so today I'm going to be your moderator. Impact Austin has wanted to do an educational webinar on the best ideas for giving with passion and purpose to discuss strategies of giving today and in the future. I'm particularly passionate about this topic when I'm not volunteering at Impact Austin. I run a wealth management practice, um, Palumbo Wealth Management Group at Merrill Lynch, and I am both a certified financial planner and a certified investment management analyst. I am looking forward to our session. I am grateful to you guys in our audience, our participants, and particularly grateful to our members who have agreed to volunteer in yet another way um, with Impact Austin by serving um, in their role as subject matter experts um, to help with our conversation today. So our professional lineup um, and our panelists, thank you so much. Um, welcome to Sarah Panton. Sarah has been a member of Impact Austin since 2006, and she provided the seed contribution to get our permanent endowment started, the Rebecca Warren Powers Endowment of Impact Austin. And when she's not volunteering for Impact Austin, she runs a wealth management practice at Asset Strategies Group, LLC. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Pam Friedman. She's been uh, in the Impact Austin class of 2015. She is also a certified financial planner and runs the Austin office of Robertson Stevens, a registered investment advisory firm. Welcome, Pam, and thank you for um, your corporate sponsorships in the past. Um, Next, I'd like to introduce Liz Nielsen. Liz has been a member of Impact Austin since 2017. She is a trust and estate planning lawyer and runs Nielsen Law PLLC. Um, our next speaker is Mary Blagan. Mary was on the board of Impact Austin until quite recently and was our treasurer. And she's been a member of Impact Austin since 2015. She is a retired executive from very long service at U.S. Banks, which is headquartered uh, up in the Twin Cities. And she'll be presenting the philanthropist point of view um, on our panel. And our final panelist is our own Impact Austin Executive Director, who uh, you all probably know quite well, Christina Borchinski, and she'll wrap up our discussion with the case for the endowment. Um, when we conduct Q&A through our, we will be conducting Q&A through our Zoom site, and you'll see two options for communications. The chat function will allow you to communicate with both the panelists um, as well as other participants. That's a good place to um, ask for clarification or to share um, your own comments. The Q&A tab is where um, it's the best place to ask your questions that we'll address at the end of our webinar. And then as soon as we conclude, conclude our Q&A, um, we will do a short preview of a, an upcoming event on October the 16th, Investing with a Gender Lens. And we will um, invite Mary Jovanovich of Swab Charitable and Suzanne Wheeler of Mariner, excuse me, Mariner Wealth Advisors here in Austin. And Mary and Suzanne, thank you for joining us and thank you for your corporate sponsorships. We greatly appreciate it. All right, so let's get started. Um, we, instead of sitting on a nice comfy stage with a bunch of comfy chairs um, where we're all having, a, you know, engaging, uh, panel discussion, we're going to do this webinar style, and so you'll hear from each of our speakers. So um, Sarah is going to get us started out. Sarah, welcome. You have been around philanthropy with Impact Austin, uh, and as a personal philanthropist, 
also in your work as an advisor with your client families who are charitably inclined, I think you're in a great position to talk to us about how we should think differently about giving to an annual fund, a capital campaign, memorial gifts, and endowment gifts. Can you kind of explain the differences for purposes for when an individual or a family would want to give to one versus another? Thank you, Susan. This is a great way to kick it off, I believe. And I want you to think as a backdrop about why you give. You know, then we can determine and the differences between lifetime versus legacy gifts. So to start off, think about why do you give? And in this case, specifically to Impact Austin, are you wanting to help others, perhaps through our grant making, clearly, uh, to set a good example? Um, are you inspired, perhaps, by someone with a personal connection? And then I think for most of us, we want to give back and truly to make a difference in this life. So if you think about that and what are the differences in your purposeful, impactful giving, we think about our annual fund, which speaks to us about raising funds for operations, for grant making. We talk here about sustainability we want to keep our organization running for the purposes and for the mission. And so sustainability around an annual fund. I think of the next level of giving as perhaps a capital campaign where it's for a specified purpose and typically for a finite period of time. Um, this year, a lot of our nonprofits have had to raise money for increased technology. We didn't plan, did we, on Zoom and all of the different media to hold our wonderful annual meeting, this webinar. So that's a specified purpose. And we have received a lot of special gifts toward that. It could also be a focus toward building an endowment. And typically those long range purpose gifts or maybe a two to three year campaign where you make a pledge for several years. I also think here, and maybe it's an easy concept as women, um, to think about having different purses. We have the purse we reach into for our ongoing needs. That's what we do for our annual fund and maybe even for a capital campaign. We could also include memorial gifts with that purse, where we want to give a lifetime gift, perhaps, to celebrate the life of someone who has passed on, who set a good example, maybe in our lives, and who truly made a difference in our community. And then speaking to my heart, the next level of giving perhaps suggests not just a lifetime of giving, but leaving a legacy behind through our endowment. I know Christina is gonna talk some more about it and get into details, but think of the endowment that we established to honor our founder, Rebecca Warren Powers, for permanence. Now again, you can leave a lifetime gift for that through cash, we love cash. Um, this is a great way to give highly appreciated stocks, securities, and I think Pam is gonna get more into detail on that note. but. I truly think the endowment and the education we're providing today speaks to another facet of our mission, and that is educating women around philanthropy. And you're all philanthropists that are on this, this program. So circle back, think about the purse that you use on a day-to-day -day basis and giving to our ongoing operations for sustainability but think about that evening bag that you might have and reach into for these special gifts, whether it be a capital campaign or if your heart is to leave a legacy um, beyond our lifetimes with our endowment. 
I love the quote here, Susan, I'll close with, and it's from Winston Churchill. Um, I happen to be an Anglophile, but he is the one who said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Happy to answer questions at the end, but I'll pass it back to you at this time. Thank you, Sarah. We appreciate the distinction that you put together. And um, again, thank you for getting us started uh, several years ago with the Rebecca Warren Powers uh, Endowment. So thank you for helping us kind of practice what we preach. All right, so Pam. Um, Hi there. FP, and as an advisor to your clients around charitable gifts, talk about in a little more detail what um, Sarah kind of teed up for us, which is the lifetime gifts versus bequests and the advantages and disadvantages of each. Um, well, once someone has decided to give for all the great reasons that Sarah mentioned, um, the method of giving becomes a bit more important. Lifetime gifts um, may initially seem more desirable. You have sort of um, the, the emotional benefit for the donor and certainly the charity gets the money faster and they, they like that a lot. Um, bequests, which is just a fancy word for giving as part of your estate plan, may seem less desirable on the face of it, um, but it's really important for charities and their sustainability. Uh, those investments, they may come from investments that have grown over time and then are part of your estate plan and you're giving um, upon death. Um, so, of course, you can always do both. You can give lifetime gifts and you can, for more permanence and, and give uh, uh, for uh, bequests and there's lots of different ways to give. The decision between the two for me as an advisor and a financial planner is based on what your financial resources are and if you have enough to support yourself and your family, um, whether or not there's discretionary income. If there's discretionary income, it's an easier decision to make, meaning income you know, beyond your monthly normal expenses. And then you can consider some lifetime giving and even giving over time to some of these more permanent type funds uh, with a commitment to that. Um, of course, if you're deep in credit card debt, probably not uh, the, the idea you're looking for, but if you're, if you're looking to do something but you can't afford the monthly, month to month kind of thing or only a small amount of lifetime giving, bequests are a great way to support the interest that you have, the charitable interest that you have. Um, and then of course, maximizing these gifts. And that I think is what we're gonna talk about next is, you know, how is it that we can uh, not just give, but give in a way that's smart, that maximizes the benefit you can provide to those charities and, and those charities can receive. Thank you. So obviously we could spend more than, you know, the whole day talking about taxes, but Taxes are confusing. Talk a little bit about income tax deductibility and some of the special opportunities this year about the CARES Act. I think Liz is going to touch on estate tax. Um, Great. But yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, uh, so I'll put my green, green shade on my counting hat uh, <laughs> for a bit here. Um, so hopefully it won't get too boring, but I'll try to stay high level. Uh, look, our government views charitable giving as a public good, and it is a public good. And, and as such, it affords charitable donations some benefits, particularly tax benefits. And taxes are confusing, and I can, I, I can practically hear people on this call, like, turn their ears off when they, you talk about taxes. But knowing how your taxes work and knowing some of the terms can really just maximize that giving effort that you're trying to make. So it's important to understand terms like cost basis, capital gains, itemized deductions, and how to calculate your adjusted gross income. And, and I'm gonna get into some of that, but not all that now, but maybe it's more important to sit down with a financial advisor um, or a CPA and talk about how can I give a little bit more? How can I use these things that the government offers so that I can benefit my charities even more? You asked about the CARES Act. Um, in response to the pandemic, of course, we have the Coronavirus Aid 
Relief and Economic Securities Act, which is called the CARES Act, was passed by Congress. And, and part of the act was meant to support nonprofits in an age of economic hardship. So one of the, one of the key benefits that, uh, that's maybe small but mighty under the CARES Act is that there's a universal deduction. So even if you don't itemize, which for, for many people, they don't, nine out of 10 people don't itemize their deductions, you can deduct up to $300 so long as the donation is made in cash or food. Um, in other words, so even when itemized deductions aren't an option, which is really how you can you know, give even more uh, and get a tax benefit for even more, even when your itemized deductions don't exceed what's called the standard deduction, you'll still get that $300 benefit. There are a couple other tax issues and again, I encourage you to talk to your CPA or your financial advisor to, to understand it. Currently, you can deduct up to 60% of your adjusted gross income, which is just your income from all sources, whether it's capital gains or salary. Um, less certain deductions, mainly your, your, your retirement contribution, a few others. Um, so you're able to give 60% of your AGI right now before the CARES Act. Now it's 100% with the CARES Act. Um, which can be a tool, especially if you're maybe older and talking to your advisor where you don't have a lot of income, you can give 100% of your income and more asset-based folks can do that. So long again, as it's in cash and food donations and it's given directly to a charity, that's to get the money to the charity faster. And that's, uh, that's an important part of this. So it all brings up the standard deduction. Uh, we talked about you know, cost basis, and we'll talk some more about that. But the standard deduction is the deduction everybody takes on their taxes, which under some tax relief back in 2017 went much higher. So in order to get the real benefit from the itemized deduction of charitable contributions, you have to exceed that standard deduction. For individuals, that's 12,400. For married people, is 24,800 for 2020. So if your other itemized deductions like interest on your mortgage or property taxes don't exceed that, your charitable contribution isn't giving you as much of a tax benefit, but there's other ways around that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some other ideas to, to be able to maximize uh, your charitable donation. So those are the main uh, tax ideas, but I encourage you to talk to your CPA about more. Super helpful. And that kind of leads us in. We've got probably about a minute and a half left, Pam, um, to <laughs> about appreciated stock and um, the special IRA um, qualified charitable distribution QCDs, if you could cover that. So real quickly on appreciated stock, um, you can donate stock that's grown, cost basis is the amount you pay for the stock. And it doesn't just have to be stock, it could be any asset. And then if it has some gains, if you give that asset, that stock, that property, that other asset, there's loads of categories, you now don't pay that tax when you give it to the charity, you avoid that tax, and you've given, been able to give a bigger donation to a charity. So um, there's lots of ways to do that. One of that is one of those is through a donor advice fund. And certainly there's ways for many charities to be able to accept uh, assets. In terms of QCDs, you can give from your IRA. This year, you don't have to take required minimum distributions from your IRA. Those required minimum distributions were the percentage that you had to take every year after you're now 72. It used to be 70 and a half, age 70, 70 and a half. Using that, uh, qualified uh, charitable deduction from an IRA, um, you can uh, up to $100,000 from an IRA. You can, again, avoid the tax that would normally happen when you um, withdraw from your IRA at those ages. So uh, QCDs can also be, a qualified distribution, charitable distributions can be a valuable tool for those who are a little bit older. Very, very helpful, Pam. Thank you. We could have spent uh, really the whole hour um, talking about all the different strategies that you touched on. Thank you so much. And if anybody has questions, of course, reach out to any of the speakers. These are all um, very knowledgeable subject matter experts. So 
Thank you, Pam. Welcome, Liz. Um, give us a brief orientation to estate taxes and who should be thinking about the implications of estate taxes. Thanks so much, Susan. And the laws around estate taxes have really changed a lot in the past few years. Um, at the end of 2017, the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that Pam had mentioned, it doubles it doubled the estate tax exemption amount. So that means that each individual can transfer either through lifetime gifts or bequests up to $11.58 million to their chosen individual beneficiaries without paying a cent of estate tax. And for a married couple, they can combine that to over $23 million. And so that means that really most of the conversations I'm having with clients these days really are not as much focused on estate taxes and really more focused on really the goals and priorities of the family. Of course, these laws can change. Um, currently, the estate tax exemption amount is set to sunset at the end of 2025, at which point the exemption would probably go down to around six or seven million dollars, uh, depending on inflation. But Congress could act sooner and really change the law at any time, so we don't know um, what those changes will look like until they actually happen. So for families where estate tax is a concern, there's lots of things that we can do to help reduce the amount that you have to pay. Um, and one of the most common ways to do this is, for people who are charitably inclined is to make a bequest to charity. Um, and this is really because you don't have to pay estate taxes on, on gifts to charity when you pass away. Um, but even for families where estate tax is not a concern, I still think it's really important to think about charitable giving as part of the estate plan. And I ask nearly every client of mine um, if they want to include um, a charity as part of their plan. And while certainly not everyone does, I think it's really an important thing to bring up, um, even for those families where, you know, estate taxes is not our primary concern. Talk about some of the strategies um, that you use with your clients um, in estate plans. And you might talk a little bit as part of that as charitable charitable split interest trusts as well. Sure, so, you know, one way, of course, is just to make an outright bequest to charity. This could be done in your will or in your living trust. Um, another thing that you can do is, you know, make a charity a beneficiary of maybe a life insurance policy or retirement plans. And actually, um, retirement uh, beneficiaries can be a really good way to make a gift to charity. I actually had some clients come in a few weeks ago who told me they wanted to make a pretty significant bequest to their alma mater. They're both Longhorns. Um, and I noticed that the wife had a pretty sizable IRA. So I recommended that they make the gift to charity from that retirement account. And I explained that's because the retirement plan proceeds are actually worth more to the University of Texas than they would be to their children. And that's because the retirement uh, plan assets will eventually be taxed to the beneficiary. They're going to have to pay the income tax on it. Um, if the beneficiary is an individual, it's taxed as ordinary income. But if the beneficiary is a charity, the charity is uh, tax exempt and therefore um, really does not lose any part of that inherited benefits to income tax. Um, some other ways that people might make a bequest to charity, sometimes people have a, a donor advised fund and you can actually make a bequest to a donor advised fund. Um, some families have already um, set up a private foundation or maybe they want to set up a private foundation as part of their estate plan. Um, so that um, sometimes we'll do that. And then another way is through what's called a split interest charitable trust, which you were asking about, Susan. And a split interest charitable trust really allows you to pass wealth to your heirs in a really um, tax efficient way while also supporting um, charity. I um, mean, the gift to charity either could be now or down the road. And they are called split interest charitable trusts because the financial interest from the trust is split between a charity and a non-charity, like your children. Thank you so much. So you can create those during your lifetime. And so, again, you talked about the split interest trust as being something where you can give your assets to both the charitable interest as well as your children. So you kind of get a both and, but can you elaborate on, you know, some other reasons or what some of your clients say about why that's important to them? Yeah, sure. And there are, um, you know, ways to, to do these split interest charitable gifts um, as um, 
you know, a beneficiary of your estate as well as lifetime. And there's sort of two general types of the split interest trust. There's what's called a charitable lead trust and then what's called a charitable remainder trust. And they're basically inverses of each other. The charitable lead trust makes a gift to charity for a number of years, and then it um, is paid out to your uh, chosen beneficiaries at the end of the term. Um, whereas a charitable remainder trust makes sort of annual distributions to your chosen beneficiaries. And then at the end of the term, the remainder is distributed to charity. And one of the times I'm really talking about charitable trusts uh, with my clients right now are for clients that have really large uh, retirement accounts. Um, and this is because of another recently passed law. It's called the SECURE Act, and it became the law at uh, the end of 2019. And it really changed how beneficiaries are taxed on inherited retirement accounts. Uh, so when a qualified retirement account passes to the individual beneficiaries, the beneficiary still has to pay the income tax on distributions from those accounts. Before uh, January 1st, 2020, the beneficiaries could stretch out the required minimum, minimum distributions, uh, the RMDs, over their life expectancy. So if you left your retirement account to a grandchild, they could have you know, 50 years to stretch out those required minimum distributions. Um, and that meant that each of those was relatively small and also made it more tax efficient because it's less likely to bump the beneficiary up into a higher income tax bracket. Under the SECURE Act, now most beneficiaries have to withdraw the entire amount within 10 years of the owner's death. So this accelerates the income tax, um, increases you know, the amount that's going outright to that beneficiary, which you know, might not be what you know, sometimes people want for their children or grandchildren. I um, mean, it's also likely to increase the amount of tax due since it will likely bump the beneficiary into a higher income tax bracket. So an alternative to this is a charitable remainder trust. The trust can provide the beneficiary receives a payment of say 5% of the trust value every year for the rest of their life. And then at the end, after the beneficiary passes away, any remainder can go to charity. And so um, this can be a really good um, technique to use for clients who, um, for my clients who wanna benefit a charity and are also concerned about their beneficiaries receiving a large of money large amount of money all at once and what the income tax yeah. consequences of that are. Really good information and appreciate both the background and the current law situations that are happening this year and when some of these sunset, uh, both you and, and Pam as well as Sarah have done a really good job of that. So thank you, Liz, really appreciate it. And now um, let's, introduce Mary Blagan. So Mary with a lifetime career in banking and now as a community volunteer and philanthropist, what advice do you have for somebody in the audience who might be just kind of beginning their philanthropic journey? Great, thank you, Susan. I am, I'm honored to be here today talking to this great group of women. And you've heard about all the different methods that you can use in giving your money away. So what I'm gonna focus on is who do you wanna give the money to? Where do you start when you start to think about the, the community that you want to impact? And what I'll challenge you to think through is two things. Think about it from your passion. So start with what's your passion? Where do you want to make an impact on, whether it be the Austin community or a broader community that you're thinking about and you're passionate about? Also think about it as a partnership. This is not just a kind of one and done in, from my perspective. The partnership part of it is really critical to the nonprofit, to the community, and honestly, to your family, because that's where you get that benefit. When you walk away, you, you think, man, I, I made a difference today. I fed children, I educated them, whatever. So for me and my family, our passion was around women and children, universities, and community impact. And when we went a little deeper on community impact, it really was three areas. It was food, housing, and safety. So that's kind of where we started, Susan, in this journey. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, it's, it's so, so important to hear how thoughtful you've been um, about not only giving of your time for volunteering, but, but giving of of your treasures as well. So when you think about um, your own purposes for you and Jay, and how have you wrestled with some of the issues that Pam talked about, which is the lifetime giving versus the bequest, 
And how did you kind of go through balancing that? And what have you learned about some of the structural issues that we talked about that might be helpful to you in your family giving? Right. Certainly. We actually deploy all the strategies that have been talked about today. So, and, and we really think about what it is we're going to give to. So if you start with, do I want this to be restricted money or non-restricted money to the organization? So in, in other words, um, a few years ago, for example, we were approached to look at uh, some deep research on trafficking of women in Minnesota and Texas, which for me was my heart. I lived in both places. So that's a restricted gift. The money we gave was for that purpose only, was to do that research. However, when we got involved with Special Olympics, we really got involved on a volunteer basis. And if you're just starting this journey, it's a great way to get involved and learn about the organization. And our son joined us at those events. We went to food banks and we packed grocery bags and we gave him a sense that not everybody comes home to a house like he had. And not everybody has that safety and security. He needed to see the broader world, not too realistic right away, but that's important. So we also have given in obviously lifetime gifts, but we do a, be a bequest. So we have set up a scholarship at a university. When we're gone, there will be an enduring scholarship that will allow children who can't afford an education to afford an education. So we've tried to really make use of a donor advised fund, the regular giving, a bequest, as, it, as our nonprofits need. So that's really what we let drive. And then we answer it out of, I love Sarah's comment about the purses. We have lots of purses and we just, depending on what our nonprofits need, we go to the various purses. Awesome. And I love this story um, about involving your son in this process um, from earlier years. So for, you know, that is such an important way to extend this legacy into the next generation that I think a lot of times um, we don't think about the impact that we have as role models. So um, I really love that. That's awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. Really, really appreciate it. And appreciate all that you do for our nonprofits. Um, it's, it's awesome. You're welcome. All right. Um, now let's bring in um, our executive director, Christina Gorchinsky. Christina, you and I have the, the great pleasure of meeting off and talking about all these kinds of issues. Um, and, you know, we talk about how proud we are as an organization that we've given over $7 million into the greater Austin area since 2003. Um, but I have to think in my professional world where we talk about how powerful the time value of money is that if we had put just a little bit of that money into our own endowment, um, even, you know, a, a, a fairly modest endowment of a half a million dollars um, grows pretty quickly given the time value of money. And even with a conservative draw, that can provide that um, permanence that Sarah was talking about, which is allowing um, a draw off of that endowment to cover our operating expenses. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how the endowment could really change the calculus of how you run our foundation and really what is, what is the business case? What is the Impact Austin case for the endowment? Thank you so much, Susan. I know we have these conversations one-on-one -on -one all the time, so it's fun to have this conversation one-on-one, -on -one, but with a lot, of, a lot of women who also are interested in learning more. So thanks for your dedication to the endowment. Um, the, the movie of the summer, in my opinion, is definitely Hamilton. And there's a line in Hamilton um, where he says that legacy is planting seeds for a garden you'll never see. And so there's one way to think about um, plan giving and legacy giving and giving to our endowment is about planting seeds um, that for years to come will best serve our organization. So 
As far as Impact Austin goes, um, we as an organization have really demonstrated um, for our, over our 18 years that we um, are committed to the concept of pooling funds collectively. We, we each year um, collectively raise dollars for nonprofits through our collective um, grant making that we do. Our annual contributions, each member's annual contributions goes to cover um, the grants that we distribute and the additional um, operations contribution of our members um, from our members goes to support the, administ uh, the administration, how we administer our grant making. All additional programming that we do, so and, um, the events we do, the various volunteer and leadership opportunities we provide, um, and special initiatives of Impact Austin, like the capacity building we've been doing um, lately, really they require additional fundraising. So we as an organization um, spend time and um, resources to um, raise funds to do the incredible work that, that we do. And each year, as we know, part of our model is that each year at the end of a fiscal year, um, we, we hit reset and we start all over again. So we spend um, uh, the time raising money for nonprofits through our annual contributions um, and, and then also raising funds for Impact Austin um, ourselves to continue to produce our incredible programming. So um, when we think about long-term sustainability, Impact Austin has demonstrated for year after year that we are a sustainable organization and we have a model where where we are strong enough in, at, with a foundation that we're gonna raise that money for the, org for the community. And in order to, so when it comes to sustainability, we've got annual contributions through membership dues, um, and additional uh, fundraising that we do through our annual fund and our event sponsorships. When it comes to permanence, and in order to ensure permanence for Impact Austin, requires long-term investment in Impact, Austin in, in Impact Austin's endowment. And there are two um, examples I can give to, to illustrate how two other collective giving organizations have really effectively done this. Um, the first is the Washington Women's Foundation. Susan and I and um, Nicole from our team went to, um, went to Seattle earlier um, this year to meet with other collective giving groups. And in this exchange of ideas, when we met with the Washington Women's Foundation, um, they were founded 25 years ago. So they have about um, 10 years on us as learning these lessons. So it was like talking to ourselves in the future. And one thing they said was, if um, one of the things and a decision they made to invest in their endowment and to work with their members to, make, um, to, to provide for Impact Austin in their planned giving and legacy giving, that they built up their endowment um, to $4 million, and that is through several bequests and also from some members making um, contributions to the endowment. We have donors right now and members who, who do make annual contributions. Each one of our board members makes an annual contribution um, to the endowment. And as I'm looking at the participant list, quite a few of you are already making um, annual contributions. So through that $4 million, and thank you very much for that. Susan and I are, and our whole team is really grateful. Um, but the, what the Washington Women's Foundation is able to do with that $4 million is they're able to draw 4% of that $4 million annually, which then covers about $170,000 to cover programming. So they have four, full, four and a half um, staff members um, that do their grants coordination. So they have a staff member that is administering their grants to make sure that their volunteers still have a meaningful experience volunteering, but that volunteers aren't carrying the exclusive load of doing our, their grant making. Um, they're able to produce 50 events a year for their members because they've got a full-time staff member focused on strategic partners and partnerships and programming. They have one staff member dedicated solely to member stewardship and making sure each member has um, the, the best experience to learn, to get involved in philanthropy in the same ways um, we encourage our members. So they cover their operations, they have additional funding to cover programming. And this is something that really is, you know, it's, it's huge um, to think about the, this, this accomplishment. It's also something that's really possible to us. So this would affect the way that we are budgeting for Impact Austin right now, in that we would have um, rather, I would say, rather than really working day to day on a daily basis to raise the funds needed, 
to keep our organization stable with an endowment you know that for years to come you're able to um, we will be able to draw down on that and one other quick example i know we've got some questions is with the um, boise idaho collective giving circle and rather than primarily bringing um bringing in investments to their endowment through um through doing a you know big capital campaign or getting those really large requests is from the very beginning they prioritized giving um, a little bit of each, investing a little bit of each member's contribution into an endowment that even at $900,000, what they've been able to achieve through those individual, um, that early history of their organizations and their founders to build out for permanence, with 4% with on that, um, they're able to also have a staff member. So with, with whatever range and how we can build up our endowment, this will, we will know for years to come indefinitely that that garden is going to bloom, that whether or not you personally are able to donate hours of your time and, and individual resources year to year, that our, we have the ability to invest money that for years to come, we'll, we will be able to draw from and support long-term operations, long-term programming for Impact Austin, so that we know those funds our members are, com are contributing are going right back out into the community. Christina, thank you so much. Um, it, you've provided us a really great vision of a future that Impact Austin can have. And um, I know that since our operations um, certainly are more expensive than the $250 portion of each member's contribution, you will um, be happy for that day. So thank you. Well, let's open it up to Q&A. As a reminder, put your um, questions in the Q&A tab. Um, and one has come in that I am going to ask uh, that is um, directed to all panelists. And the question is, an IRA can have a donor advice fund as a primary or a contingent beneficiary. How can this option be used as a way to stretch an impactful, charitable gift over the time period of the donor's choosing, parentheses, lifetime giving continuing past the donor's lifetime. So I think that's probably a Pam and Liz question. I'll hand that off, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, so you can appoint a new effectively trustee of that donor advised fund. There's terms for it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but effectively you would hand off at your death someone else to be the giver of a donor advised fund beyond your lifetime. So you're effectively, um, it's, it, it, that person would be inheriting it they wouldn't benefit it from it. The charities would still benefit, but it would be that person who would then donate on your behalf. So I'll let Liz take over from there. Yeah, no, that's exactly right, Pam. And sometimes for families that want to do that, you know, we talk about maybe putting together some sort of, you know, instructions for the successor manager of that donor advised fund. So they kind of can know, you know, what types of organizations um, they might want to have uh, benefited. Of course, there are some limitations as well, one of which is that, you know, you don't have very much control over how, how long those charitable gifts would continue. The manager could decide to, to give it all out in the first year or to have it, you know, never make a distribution from it. So there definitely is, you know, not as much control over it as there are maybe, you know, using a community foundation or a, um, a private foundation, some other type of, of charitable um, bequest that could continue for, for much longer after your lifetime. But I think it's a really good way for a lot of families to um, maybe include their, their children in uh, making those decisions long term. And often for clients that are wanting to, you know, build something like this, I recommend that someone maybe join an organization like Impact Austin and really see how to make those grant uh, giving uh, decisions. Um, and I think that can be really, really positive. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, one of our audience members really liked Sarah's metaphor of the different purses as an introduction to different types of giving. And I know Mary Blagan picked up on that as well. 
Um, Sarah or the or others on the panel, would you quickly recap by naming the various purses that we might want to have in our philanthropic collection? I'll, I'll start that discussion. Thank you. And thank you for the, the question because we didn't really have time to go deep. But let's think about the purse that we carry with us on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we have a favorite. I'm not one, frankly, that changes purses with every outfit. I will leave something behind. So my day-to-day -day, uh, purse, I might think about a cash gift for ongoing operations to our annual fund. It could also be for a capital campaign. But let's think really smart and where we'll make the best impact with our money. If we happen to have a portfolio that has some uh, highly appreciated stocks, um, believe it or not, they are out there in certain sectors. Maybe you wanna take some money off the table from, I'll use as a great example, Apple. Yeah. <laughs> you take that, you're gonna pay capital gains, right? But if you donate it to Impact Austin, that to me is a whole different level of giving and that might involve my evening purse and a purse that I use for special occasions. Very, very thoughtful kind of giving. Um, maybe even a smarter level of giving from that purse and it can be the lifetime gift that we've talked about. Others may want to weigh in on how that can also be a bequest. Um, and then I think of a third purse that is so valuable. I've even had um, clients who have personal property that they want to pass on to their heirs um, of significance. Um, you could use that purse even as a, a bequest and use vehicles, one that we haven't even talked about, but I do estate planning also using life insurance. Maybe you even have an old personal life insurance policy for which the need is no longer there. The kids are grown. You don't need that protection. They're not dependent on you. You could gift that policy to Impact Austin. And I know Liz is shaking her head, has used that, but that is such a simple gift. And I'll let you continue that thread, Liz, if you'd like. Yeah, I find um, life insurance um, can be a surprisingly good way to make a gift to charity. I have a client that I'm working with right now that um, wants to give it a, a relatively significant amount and she's funding it with a, a, a newly acquired uh, life insurance policy, um, which works really well for her family. Um, I think another purse you can look at is certainly your, uh, your retirement accounts, um, both right. for um, lifetime giving and for, um, you know, giving after you pass away. I think that can be very tax efficient. And I know Pam spoke a lot about um, making the, the QCDs, the, the qualified charitable um, gifts. And I think that can be a really good um, way. Of course, you want to make sure that you're working um, directly with the, um, the financial institution. You can't take your requirement and distribution and then give it to charity. That doesn't work. It has to go straight from your IRA to the charity. But if you are um, I think it's over 70 and a half. Um, that can be a really, really tax efficient way and, and sort of a good, you know, person money to think about for your, your charitable giving. So Susan, I'm going to jump in just real quickly. And when you're making the decision between a donor advised fund and your purse, your daily purses, as, as Sarah was talking about in my cash, what I try to stay really clean about is at the beginning of the year is I'll set aside a percentage of our annual income. So whatever we make, I'm going to give that away as cash. And I'll use that cash when I'm buying a table or when it's kind of a, a directed thing, but I'm going to have a benefit out of it. So I'll buy the table. I'll do something like that. I don't go to my donor advised funds for those kinds of gifts. I stay really clean with my donor advised funds that when I'm going to give a gift that like an annual gift to Impact Austin, I get nothing for it. Christina and her team use that to really make the impact on the Austin community. That comes from my donor advised fund because that way I know all those monies are going there. Nothing's coming back to me. I'm not having a wonderful lunch at an event and seeing all my friends. And it just makes my taxes at the end of the year when my CPA is going through everything, I can sit there and say, no, here's, here's how I did it. And I start at the beginning, beginning of the year 
really focused on what do I want to do. Now, there's always things that come up during the year that you say, oh my gosh, I have to, I have to take care of this. And you will, you'll figure out, you know, what other purse you can go to and, you know, more you might, more, uh, yeah, exactly. You might rearrange, but so think about it that way as well. Awesome. Christina, you want to close us out before we move on to our preview of our October event? I, I really want to first start off by saying thank you to you, Susan, for putting this incredible event together and for your commitment to, um, to, to really meeting every one of our members where they are on their philanthropic journey. And I know this was something that was requested um, by a lot of our members. And I just want to quickly say, too, that I know that some of you, because you've let me know informally, have remembered Impact Austin and some of your legacy giving. And I urge you to consider um, giving us the opportunity to celebrate you in your lifetime. So during this, during this time. So even if this is a gift that um, you know will be coming to Impact Austin, I would love for you to reach out and I will reach out to some of you who have said this informally so that we can, um, we can honor you now um, for this significant gift. And, and I hope that I've planted some seeds and these fabulous women have planted some seeds that will grow for years to come. Um, and and I, I, would, I would urge all of you that if you have Impact Austin already laid out or considered in your, um, in your planned giving, or if you're considering that, to please reach out to us and let us know so that we can celebrate you. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you, Christina. And um, I'm so excited for this metaphor of my everyday purse, my work purse, my going out to dinner purse, my evening purse, the special trip purse that I bought when I was on a lifetime trip to Shanghai. So um, we've got a great visual image. So thanks to our panelists. I am now going to shift and do the introduction of um, our two uh, speakers that are going to get you excited about our great October seminar, Investing with the Gender Lens. And so I am going to introduce uh, our two newest friends, Mary Jovanovich, who's with Schwab Charitable. Uh, we met Mary at the um, Catalyst Falanos conference where um, Schwab was, was involved there, and Suzanne Wheeler, who is here in Austin, with us and she runs a wealth management practice uh, at Mariner. And so ladies, thank you for your sponsorship and we're excited about your October 16th noon central time event. So give us a preview of what we're gonna learn about. Thank you, ladies. Sure, thank you, Susan. <clears throat> Again, my name is Suzanne Wheeler and I'm with Mariner Wealth Advisors. I'm excited to be part of the webinar that Susan mentioned in October, where we think we have a great lineup and something that we will, uh, that you will enjoy because it's about women. So who couldn't get excited about that? But honestly, in a nutshell, it, it's really about women helping women. And things that we'll talk about in this seminar will be knowing your value. Um, we've certainly made excellent strides over the years, and we want to empower you to know what your value is and what you bring to the table. We'll also be discussing Investment 101, so we've heard a lot uh, here today about um, using investments as a way of um, your charitable giving. So we're going to show you ways to make uh, those investments become appreciated stock. So you will have that opportunity to give, as well as values-based investing, because we, we've talked a lot about what our values might be, where we want to give charitably, but also where can you invest um, that shows your value. And then last but not least, and I know Mary's going to touch on this, uh, really excited to be uh, speaking with her talking about uh, charitable giving and uh, legacy giving. Mary? 
Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you again, Susan, for the opportunity today. And I loved hearing this discussion because I'm even more excited about our October 16th event. And the reason why, it goes back to that concept, like you said, of purses, but more importantly, what Mary said earlier when, it talk, when she talked about, you know, your passion and your partnership with these organizations. And for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my own personal journey um, in, in the event itself. And please think about this from everybody comes from different backgrounds, and that's what I love about Impact Austin, is they're trying to meet you where you are currently. And so philanthropy isn't just about giving money. It's about how you consume, how you invest, and how you might give your money away. And so what I like to talk about are the five T's. And so that has to do with your time, your talent. Yes, maybe eventually your treasure, but your testimony. You can support causes just by using your voice. And then most importantly, your ties. How can you gather others around you? Because while you may not be able to give, you might know people who can give. And so how do you bring them into the conversation? And so that's what we're going to talk about. So it's going to be a very inclusive conversation regardless of where you are at your life and then we'll show you how you can put these um, actionable items into practice in your own personal life according to what you're passionate about and those partnerships you want to make in your lifetime so thank you again for having us well I'm excited I can't wait for October the 16th I love the idea of Mary, you have brought in a lot of things that are important to Gen Z and some of our mm -hmm. millennial members, which is a focus of Impact Austin is, you know, that's part of our own sustainability is bringing on younger uh, members and you've hit on a lot of themes that are going to be really important to them. Uh, Suzanne, you know, I think really understanding investing options with mm -hmm. gender focus and really tying that into how we can support other women. So, so important. And all of that feeds into our DEI framework, which we're on that journey for diversity, yeah. equity, and inclusion, uh, as well as helping us be better uh, philanthropists and stewards in our community. So we are delighted to have you. Thanks to our participants. We've had some nice comments uh, from a number of people in the chat bar that it sounds like uh, it was a value. Remember that we um, have recorded this. If you uh, want to go back and take another look at it, please join us on October 16th. And again, a, a very, very special thank you to our panelists who have shared uh, their personal stories and their uh, professional capabilities we just skated across the surface of a lot of things, uh, but thanks everybody. Um, and please be safe out there. And we look forward to the day when we can celebrate together. Thank you so much.